win. So it's a nice day. Uh, this morning, Chuck Thompson, Director of Counseling Services, is here to share with us. You may have seen him in your first year seminar or <coughs> may have or have had a class with Chuck. Uh, we're grateful that, that you're here with us. Let's open with prayer. Lord, we give you this time, this hour, in praise and worship and thanksgiving to you. We give you all of the concerns and cares that we bring this morning. We give you our family and our friends. And we give you our very lives. Open our hearts and our minds and continue to lead us so we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. one really hard time in our life where you just feel devastated and your world's falling apart and there's nothing you feel like you can do about it and just the harder you try to fix things the worse they tend to get so what this first song's talking about um, oceans it's comparing those hard times in our lives to oceans in huge waves and the only way that we're not going to drown is by taking our eyes off of the waves and off of our problems and setting them on God and trusting in him to lead us through it so please go ahead and stand and worship with us today. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, with feet made.
a lot of bang. I don't know who you are, but Frida is uh, a new professor in the nursing department. I haven't met you, but your question to me the other day that you sent me an email, email was, which group of students are the biggest pests at King College, at King University? And, and I'm afraid I am the one you should ask that question of. It's the abnormal psychology students. Um, they run around the universe and go to lunch and diagnose uh, whoever they're sitting next to and their brother. And I apologize to you all. That's partly my fault. They'll do better. Um, but, you know, they might not be wrong either. So you ought to listen to them. They're all smart folks, as well as being pests. So. See, that was funny, that was a joke. And I'll, if I tell another joke, I'll clue you in and then you'll know. Um, another question that came from a student named Hugo, he's from Scotch Plains, New Jersey, and he came here primarily because he is such a huge sports fan. And in particular, he's in love with watching sports, and in particular, it's bowling. So Hugo's a little disappointed. And he had this question for me, and that question is, what is the worstest pain? So obviously, he's not a second year English student, um, although he might have been listening to me if he's talking like that. So Hugo, I don't know who you are, but if you're here, this is for you. What is the worstest pain? I can tell you the worst pain I've ever felt. And I've felt some pretty big ones. I've had an abscess tooth, that was pretty bad. I've had a kidney stone, uh, that was pretty bad. But the worst pain that I ever felt was many careers ago, I had a youth group and we went to the beach one Saturday and uh, I got way too much sun and I got sun poisoning. And I, I really, it was incredible that something could happen to me like that. But I got this itch. <coughs> on my back, and it was an itch that would, I mean, I took cold showers, I put cream on it, I did everything I could possibly do, and this is, I crossed my heart, this is the truth, I found myself standing in the garage, and in my hand was one of those uh, metal toothbrushes, you know, the kind that you scrape crumbs off your, dr your grill with, well, I was going to scrape off all of the itchy skin that somehow that seemed reasonable to me. And before I did that, I realized that's 
probably not a good idea. And we went somewhere and they gave me a shot of something that felt really good. Um, I don't know what it was, but I kept going back after that week and they wouldn't give me more, so I don't know what that was. Um, I have actually been in the room and seen childbirth, and that looked pretty hard. Um, that comedian, that's not really all that funny anymore, but I won't mention his name, but his way of determining or describing that was, childbirth is like taking your lip and then pulling it over the back of your head. And I've seen that, and that looked pretty painful. But the worst pain that I have ever seen a human being suffer is a pain that comes from, and I'm gonna pause here and say, um, I'm going to talk about some things that are going to be hard to listen to. If at some point while I'm talking, you need to drift off somewhere in your head, just do. Go to the beach. Go somewhere else and come back. If you get where you need to do that, remember this. If you feel that way, you're probably not breathing either. So I'm going to remind you right now, while I'm talking, if you start feeling overwhelmed by what I'm talking about, remember to breathe. In through your nose, out through your mouth. It's real simple. You've been doing it since you were five or six years old, honest, across my hands. <laughs> the thing I want to talk about today, and um, you know, when you ask a psychology professor to stand in front of you and talk, you get a person that sounds like a psychology professor, and I'm I'm going to do that. There's a phenomenon called borderline personality disorder. And it is probably out in the vernacular of the universe way too much with people who don't really know what it is using it all over the place. And what I'm going to talk about today is that phenomena in its most extreme form. And if you look up the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, there's a lot of things that go with that diagnosis. These folks have all kinds of emotions that come very rapidly and they're all over the place. They have all sorts of uh, relationships that they move from in a very intense way and then abandon and move to another and abandon is not the right word for them. They feel abandoned and move on to another relationship. They bounce from one very intense relationship to another. But the two terms in the diagnostic language that are the most descriptive of what's going on inside these folks is chronic feelings of emptiness. I want you to remember that. And then the second is um, frantic attempts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Those two are the things that I'm going to talk about in a little more time. But when these folks feel that, they'll do anything to feel something else. Um, in a very uncool way, sometimes these folks are referred to as cutters because a lot of times they'd rather inflict pain on themselves than feel what they're feeling. Um, I didn't see this, this is a, not my client, but I had a colleague who had worked in a hospital quite a bit, and she had a client who, when she, this is the client, when she felt this pain, the pain of that emptiness, when she felt the pain of that emptiness, she would get so desperate to not feel that, that she literally would take a pencil and run a straight pin through one end of the pencil. So if, can you picture that? Like a pickaxe? And she would poke it repeatedly into her eyeballs as a way to not feel what she was feeling. Can you imagine a pain that feels bad enough that that would make sense to you? I've, I've seen that. But it's way beyond what I felt standing in my garage with that scraper. It's way beyond that. I have a poem that is hard to listen to. It's written by a 14-year-old girl who 
gave me permission to use this. Um, this is a piece of poetry she wrote to describe what it feels like to be her a lot. I felt pain, but it wasn't there. Nothing was. So I made a new pain. It was there with blood and reality. It was real. The pain was real. The blood dripping down my hand was real. And I felt good and bad. But mostly, I was scared. I need help, I'd say out loud. But no one heard me. No one. Can you imagine what it felt like to be her? Day in and day out? No. Because that's one of the things with this diagnosis is that human beings can't handle that kind of pain that long. That's more of a um, touchstone. So the craziness that you might see with these folks is all when they're sort of managing it and it's under control. Honestly, when you see the craziness, that's under control. When it's really serious with these people, they don't do it in front of anybody. They have trouble with anger. This is sometimes referred to as rage. And the difference between those two, they're not even in the same ballpark. It's not a matter of degree. It's not the same thing. And when they get in touch with that rage, they isolate. They're by themselves. And that's when they're the most danger to themselves. Making decisions that make perfect sense to them because almost any pain feels better than the one they feel. Which, again, goes back to this emptiness. The emptiness. I mean, every pain I have ever felt has been because of the presence of something, you know? My tooth was rotten, and it started to abscess, and the pressure built up. And that, you know, just poke a hole in the side of the gum, get rid of that tooth, put a drill in it, those sorts of things. But this is a pain because of the absence of something. That's like a whole nother dimension. So if you'll tolerate it for a minute, I'd like to at least give you one psychological explanation of where that comes from. And I need somebody to be willing, and Jordan has agreed, to, would you just come and just sit on the stage right here? <coughs> And um, we've never met before, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, Jordan is going to pretend to be my mom. Um, you okay with that? I did. I think. You okay. <laughs> it depends on what happens, right? Oh, what? Imagine, and, and let me give credit where it's due. The idea that I'm about to express to you is called separation individuation. It is a developmental stage that occurs around age two. And the theory that I'm talking about is Margaret Mahler, M-A-H-L-E-R. And in Margaret Mahler's idea here, in, in Freud's idea, you internalize your dad and that's your superego and that's a big deal. But in Margaret Mahler's idea, you need to internalize your mom because your mother's, the internalization of your mother is how you comfort yourself. Ha have you ever noticed sometimes when you don't feel good that you find yourself doing this? Or maybe this. Some of you may be doing it now. Or this. W what are you doing? You're doing a little bit of what your mom did. And you are invoking the internal object, the introject of your mother. It is very important that that comforter be inside you when you don't feel good. But how does the comforter, how does that occur? Now, I'm going to explain Margaret Mahler's explanation. I'm two years old now, right? My security is my mom. She needs to be a stable person in my life. Stable means I, I can kind of predict her. And because I'm two, I like to explore the universe and I'm playing, but I keep coming back to her. See, with a two-year-old, if, if, 
if I'm two and I'm driving down the road and I'm behind the wheel, we're all in trouble. If I'm in the, if I'm strapped in the seat in the back and we're driving down the road and I look out the window and I don't have a clue where I am, but I look at my mom and she's calm, I'm not lost. Because my sense of security is external. It's her. So how do we get her internalized? And here's Margaret Mahler's, Margaret Mahler's explanation is that I must, the process is called rapprochement. Um, and I need to move away from her. I come over here and I'm playing with the ball and it dawns on me, I don't know where my security is. And my next thought is, I do know where she is, she's over there. Now notice that while I do that, the thought of her is how I'm comforting myself. But then I gotta come back here and, oh, my mother is a stable object, she's here. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that if you're a mom, you have to find a chair and sit in it. It just means you gotta be predictable. You know, you can't just simply go, oh good, that brat's out of my way, I, I can now uh, do, you know, and go and hide and get a little time away. Um, that's unstable. There's another, I'll give you another example of unstable in it later. But now I'm okay again. But sooner or later, the ball I'm playing with is going to roll further away. And I'm going to move further away. And then I'm going to realize I'm not okay because my security isn't here. So i got to move back, and the whole time I'm moving back, I've got the thought of her. Okay? So this yo-yo of going away, coming back, going further away and coming back, that process gradually internalizes my mother. And when I have my mother internalized, later, when I feel bad, I can comfort myself like this. If I need a little extra, I can do this, or this, or something chocolate. <laughs> Everybody who laughed knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, now, here's what happens when it doesn't work right. I move over here, and my mother, who is unstable, now says, now I can leave and I can go away. And when I go back to where I think she should be, if she's not there, that doesn't hurt me. Here's what hurts. I'm not willing to leave her again. She continues to be my security, but it's external. So I don't ever internalize her in order to let me figure out how to comfort me with the internal object of my mom. Here's another way it works. I move over here and she freaks out because she feels abandoned by me, the two-year-old. So what she does is she follows me so that I never get away from her. Why would someone do that? Well, if my mom happens to be borderline too and afraid of abandonment, when I move over there, that pushes the same button in her that's being installed in me, and she follows me. So I never, in a sense, get to figure out how to do that. Does that make sense? The chronic emptiness that borderline folks feel, that emptiness is about something that should be there that isn't. And what it is, is the internal comforter, the internal object of, a, of the mom, and it never got placed. And that is almost the worstest pain a human being can feel. Thanks, George. But it isn't the worst. The worst is something else. But I tell you that story to tell you this. Imagine if your mother or your comforter was God himself. Imagine what it would be like if you knew the perfect comfort. Not just the absence of a flawed, uh, flawed human being who didn't get put in you, but literally you had within you the comfort of the creator of the universe. 
and it was taken from you. You aren't feeling the absence of what you never knew. You are now feeling the absence of something you knew very well. From Matthew 27. This is just a touch of the account of Jesus' death. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shabbat Benai, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Now that's another question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm not going to answer that question. Because it is not a legitimate question. I mean no disrespect for the Savior when I say that. But that question was crying out in agony. Not, I don't know the answer. Jesus knew very well this moment was coming. The night before, he experienced a level of anxiety that we know about, but it's extreme, so that the sweat on your face has blood in it. That doesn't happen on your birthday. That's extreme. Jesus knew the hour he was facing. Why have you forsaken me? I don't know. There's some theologians in this campus, and maybe you could ask some of them what it is. But I can tell you this. Jesus knew this moment was coming, and he came anyway. And the question that may be we should ask and answer is not the one he asked here, because I think that's a reference to the pain that he was in willingly. But the question is more... Why did he have to do that? And the answer, he didn't ask the question because he knew the answer. And that's the question I think that on this season, as we anticipate celebrating that day again, and we need to celebrate with absolute joy the resurrection on Easter, but Good Friday, that's when we remember the cost. And maybe you'd think about the worst is pain and that moment for him a little differently this year. So I'm going to send you out of here in a minute. But if you'll tolerate me, instead of a benediction, I'd like you to bow your heads. And I'd like you while your heart is still and you're just breathing and you're thinking about the question, why did Jesus suffer the worst imaginable pain? And the answer is, you. you. Go from this place with the knowledge that you are loved. And the knowledge that you are loved in a way that was proven well beyond my ability to describe it or your ability to conceive it. You're loved in a way that could only be done by one. 